Sustainable Cell Development Podcast, episode 35 with Ian McCarthy. Welcome to the Sustainable Cell Development Podcast, where it's all about becoming a better version of yourself over time in a sustainable way. I believe in practicality over theory. Instead of motivation, you will find solutions. Instead of analyzing the reasons behind your problems, you will learn how to actually solve them. Instead of visualizing your goals, you will take actual steps towards them. So get ready to geek out on fitness, lifestyle, and behavior change. Improving ourselves is the point of life, and it starts with the human body. Hey guys, it is Abel here again with the Sustainable Cell Development Podcast. And in this episode, I'm happily presenting to you a really cool interview with Ian McCarthy from Lifting for Life and No Bullshit Bodybuilding. Now, I know that a good chunk of my audience who is listening to this will definitely be familiar with who Ian is, but for those of you who may not be familiar with him, he's a blogger and a YouTuber who puts out a lot of evidence-based information related to bodybuilding, fitness, and nutrition, and he is a remarkably intelligent dude who has appeared on the fitness scene a few years ago, and even then, he wowed people by how articulately he got his points across and how he was able to debate people who were much older than him and had more experience than him. So he kind of became a controversial figure at some point because he called out some people, some well-known fitness figures and bloggers publicly. But nowadays, he took a very different approach in his communication, and he's much more focused on pure content creation and providing a lot of value to people. So as far as our conversation, it was interesting. Originally, I wanted to get him on to talk about his views on making the best, most efficient progress in the gym and achieving body composition goals and how guys end up messing up their progress and diets and end up in perpetual dieting cycles. But eventually we ended up talking about his history with depression and how he used the gym and working out to fight his depression or to cope with it better. So it was a very interesting discussion that took a somewhat unexpected turn. But like I said, I think it will be very interesting for many of you. That said, I very much hope to get him on at some point again to touch on these things that I just talked about. So cool interview here. We actually also touched a little bit on his views on making it in the fitness industry, which was very interesting. And uh, I know that a lot of people listening to this are in that camp who are trying to make a way for themselves as a career in the fitness industry. So make sure to listen closely until the very end. Now, one thing that was kind of unfortunate is that my voice recording device died in the very beginning of the interview. So unfortunately, the sound quality from my end is pretty crap. But the good news is that his sound quality was actually pretty crisp. So I guess that's what matters ultimately. So I hope you enjoy this interview with Ian. And with that, let's get into the interview interview. Absolutely. I'm probably best known for my YouTube channel, Lifting for Life, which I've used as a platform to talk about evidence-based fitness for six years now. It's, it's really, it's interesting to consider it's been that long. At this point, I am more focused on my coaching company, Lifting for Life LLC. So I have a lot going on behind the scenes, which um, ultimately precludes me from directing that time and energy toward social media content, but I still do what I can there. Um, on YouTube, less than I used to, but a lot on Facebook, Instagram, etc. And ultimately, the hope is, if we really want to get to the fundamentals, it's my hope is that my work can really help people be happier, You know, give people tools that they can then use to improve their own lives. Um, and, and fitness has been the way of doing that, but <clears throat> there's certainly, I get into, I, I at least try to get into more than a, a very uh, cut and dry fitness perspective. I mean, I, I have a certain background in philosophy and am very interested in psychology. A lot of that, you know, has to do with my personal experience of depression. And then that is reflected, I think, in the, the work I do publicly as well. Right. So uh, let's let's deconstruct some of the things that you said here. So 
Um, first of all, what I'm not completely familiar. Like, what is your 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 background? Like, your study background? Did you study something related to fitness, nutrition, exercise science, something like that? No, I've never taken a nutrition or exercise science course that I can recall. In any case, I didn't have a successful university experience. I didn't enjoy it. I wasn't particularly committed to it. It didn't feel like the right thing for me. It was something that I did for years. I felt like I had to. I felt like I felt like it was the right thing in the, the sense that society perhaps believes it to be the appropriate thing for reasonably intelligent people to do. My parents, uh, I certainly believe that. And, but the, the fact that I was not engaged in it, it wasn't something that I, I wasn't passionate about it. The result was I wasn't a successful student. So around this time, two years ago, I, I realized that you know, one of my favorite phrases is the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different mm -hmm. result, which is technically incorrect, but it's very effective and something to consider. So I really internalized that at that point and said, okay, this isn't working. And just can, bashing my head against the wall isn't going to cause it to start working. So I dropped out of school and I haven't uh, attended since then. I didn't graduate. So that, that's, my, that's my lack of academic background. What I know is the result of self-education. Now, certainly I would acknowledge, you know, no one does anything worth, well, maybe there's someone, so, one person somewhere who did something worthwhile alone, but any example I can give, you know, people have people around them who are inspiring mentors from whom they learn, et cetera. And I've learned tremendous amounts from a great number of people in the, the evidence-based community. But it's not been formal. It's not been through a university environment or uh, anything like that. Right. So, um, so how did you like? When was the first time? So now you're. T you just told me you recently turned twenty four, and the first kind of the first time you appeared on YouTube was a couple of years ago, I believe. So when was the f your first exposure to to fitness and and how did that happen absolutely so i was thinking about this earlier today and my earliest exposure was probably my father lifting weights i'm not i don't recall how cuz his background in terms of exercise was actually marathon running so I'm not sure how much resistance training was ever his thing, more so than, than maybe it was more convenient than the long distance running at some point in his life. I'm unsure, but that's something he did. I was exposed to. I did on an extremely li limited basis starting maybe in 2006. So I was 13 or 14. And it, it, it was very much take it or leave it for me at that point. It didn't, it didn't click yet. So I very occasionally did it. Then I think through the boy, I was in the boy Scouts and one of the merit badges is I think health and fitness or something like this or physical mm -hmm. fitness. And at some point I did that and it did start to click in terms of, Oh, I actually want to do this as opposed to it's just kind of something I can do. And so in 2006, I started getting into it, g genuinely just wanting to improve my health. It wasn't weight loss or get bigger or really anything like that at that point. It was more, I made more of a point to uh, be physically active, which was somewhat redundant. My family lived in Paris at the time, and so everything is walking. So I was active, healthy, all this to begin with, but endeavored to emphasize it more. And then the next year, because of stressful events occurred in my private life that I wasn't able to process appropriately, I, I didn't have the tools that I have now to be able to work through things. And the result of that was I actually developed anorexia nervosa, mm. which 
I make a lot of jokes about it. I mean, it, it's funny. It, given the option, I'm not sure I would take it back because so I've grown so much as a, as a person as a result of having been through that experience and um, everything I've learned from it and, and what it you understand something on a different level if you've been through it. And again, I, I just feel that I've learned so much from it, but that was, so 2006, it started off as, as a really healthy endeavor, then it became unhealthy. And then what got me truly into consistent resistance training was realizing I needed to recover from anorexia, which obviously there's a huge psychological component, something that I've I don't think something I've said before is that you could have, you know, two sets of behavior, which externally appear the same, but in one case you have um, someone who's mentally ill, and in the other case you have someone who's very rationally endeavoring to get super lean. Now, I don't think it literally happens that way in practice. I mean, I, I think the the degree of restriction one sees with people who suffer from anorexia nervosa it does not scale precisely with the degree of restriction you see with someone who's trying to get to uh, shredded for the stage. So I'm not saying there's a, a direct equivalence like that, but I'm tr I desire to emphasize the, the psychological component. Um, so again, I needed to recover and there's a physical and psychological component to that. And on the physical side, I was still some psychopathology involved at that time. So I was rationally aware that one of the things that happens with people recovering from anorexia is they will get very over fat. And because if someone has been in, you know, starving themselves for whether it be two months, two years, in some cases it's a long time. As uh, someone I know personally, it was, I think of seven years, someone can rebound very aggressively from that. And again, I knew about that. I recognized that on a rational level. And then the, the result of the mental processing was, well, I better avoid that. So how am I going to gain weight without just getting fat? And, and the, the conclusion was lifting. And, but there was, there was a delay there, interestingly, and I didn't really get into it until January 2008. Now, from Jan January 2008 to now, so where, where are we, March 2017, I've, n I've not taken more than two weeks off of lifting, and I only ever did that once. So mm -hmm. one time I took two weeks off, and then maybe a few times I've taken like four days off, but otherwise it's been very consistent for the past uh, nine years now. Wow. Okay. That's uh, okay. So that, that's quite some information to process there. So, um, you know, you developed anorex anorexia. Um, was that, <clears throat> I mean, you mentioned that was some psychological uh, stuff in your private life that you didn't really know how to cope with at the time. Mm -hmm. um, but did you ever like suffer before you developed this from any kind of like body mis mis dysmorphia type of issue? Or, or was that like not really an issue in your, your case? No, it wasn't an issue prior to the anorexia. Um, I, it, it had never really been of significance to me. And, and that's, I realized that statement might not make much sense. So to give some additional context, I, my whole life, what's been apparent is that, you know, if we were to reduce all of Ian McCarthy to one thing, like what is the thing that Ian has? It's never been, I'm freaking jacked, uh, super athletic, whatever. It's always been that I'm reasonably intelligent and, and that's the thing I can use and that's the thing I'm good at. And um, if there's such a thing as being good at being intelligent, but in other words, that's, that's my strength. And in terms of physicality, I've always kind of been like average height on the, more thin side. I played soccer for years and years as a child. I wasn't, I genuinely wasn't bad, but I wasn't good. I was like right in the middle of the pack. And so they're, they're like how I looked and, and the shape I was in and all of this was uh, very emotionally neutral for me. 
up until <clears throat> developing anorexia, I was like, I was, I was never, I don't think I was ever really out of shape up to that point, nor was I an athletic superstar. It was just like, I was a guy. Right. Um, and then I think the, so the, the body dysmorphia developed with the anorexia slash that was, uh, you know, part of the symptoms that went along with it. And then that I'm not sure how long that stuck around, but I do not that you ask this question, but I'll say this and you know, there might be some value in me saying this. I do think that I was eventually able to fully recover. So at this point, I'm very aware of bodybuilding standards of what a, well, this is what a big guy looks like. This is what it means to be lean. But I'm also very aware that those are, you know, those are the bodybuilding standards. If you, if you are in fact a true 17% body fat, I understand that that's not a fat person. Um, so yeah, it was present for some period of time and then I was able to work through it, but it wasn't pre-existing. It, it wasn't, um, it isn't as if that set the stage for anorexia. It came with it. Right. So, um, so I, I'm interested at, at this point though. And, and I'm like, I, I like the direct kind of dive in approach that this interview took right away. So I was going to mess around a lot more with the initial, your history and whatever, but let's, let's stick with this, this theme for now. Um, so, you know, like um, people generally say, like what I hear um, is that people who have been struggling with eating disorders like this, they like that kind, like they will always have an element of that present in their life, even after recovery. So I would be curious, how do you perceive that in your own life? And, and what do you see, for example, when you're going through a cutting period now, when you look in the mirror, when you, you bulk or you're gaining weight or you're, you add in more calories, how does that affect your mind at this point? Do you think you, do you feel like you're completely independent from that side of you and that side of your past or how does that all play out in, in your mind? Yeah, I do. And I would note that I understand why people say it never fully goes away. Now, for one thing, I'm sure it never fully goes away for some people. I think that's very reasonable. I would I would not be someone to deny the direct personal experience of others in that way. And I think it's highly intuitive that if someone suffered from an eating disorder, it would never fully go away. But that has been my my experience. Um, I cut to, to give some specific examples rather than just saying, no, it, that's not what happened for me. Last year, I, I cut, it wasn't a particularly long cut, but I ended up getting a lot leaner than I expected. I, I genuinely don't recall even a single moment where um, I thought anything that even in hindsight, I would perceive as a distorted cognition. That That's a term that, uh, it's used particularly by someone named David Burns, who's a, a psychiatrist and, and a cognitive behavioral therapist. And so a distorted cognition is just a, a thought which doesn't reflect reality. And that can be anything. That can be a really attractive person believes that they are ugly. Someone who's very wealthy believes they are poor or they don't have enough money someone who is incredibly charming thinks that they're socially inept. So it, it applies to everything. But in the case of, of my physique, I, I don't, again, I can't recall even a single moment where I felt that it, it kind of got out of hand in terms of like me getting leaner, but actually thinking I was fat or anything like that. It was much more, I was making progress. I was looking better. I was pleased with that. Things were going well. It wasn't particularly hard. And then I vividly remember the moment where right at the end of the cut, I considered extending it because it had been so successful. And then it struck me that, you know, I'm not in it anymore. I wasn't, my heart wasn't in it. It mm -hmm. like it had lasted nine weeks. I think in one of the nine weeks, I didn't, 
I didn't make progress or I wasn't really focused. So it was effectively an eight week cut. And at the end, again, I had the thought, hey, I could keep pushing because it's worked, but I don't want to. And I stopped. So it was actually both physically and uh, mentally really successful and that there was no element of, of it getting out of hand in that way. And then similarly bulking, I'm fully aware that I've gained fat since the end of that cut. And now it's been around, gosh, I can't even remember now. I think around four months, I think I, I have a spreadsheet. So I put everything in the spreadsheet and then I forget what I've done, but I know that I've gained fat and I'm not, I'm not ha- happy about the fat gain specifically. I mean, I'm not literally pleased that I gained fat, but I understand that that's conducive to me making progress and feeling better and everything. So I don't fret about it. it so mm-hmm. it's, I, I think it's, I think there's a difference between kind of a rational if I were leaner, I would like that. And an irrational, I'm 17% body fat, I'm obese and like hate myself. Right. And um, just out of curiosity, so you coach people now, do you see a lot of um, kind of mindset related issues around food and body image and, and just you know, eating disorder like kind of behaviors with, with people you work with or just anecdotally, you know, people that you speak with, not necessarily on a client coaching client basis. Um, is that something that you see a lot? Interestingly, no. And I, I'm not sure why, but that just is the answer that it's quite rare that it comes up with clients or with people to whom I'm speaking, whether it be a consultation or just Facebook message. And, and that's, it's counterintuitive. One might think that given my experience, people with similar experiences would uh, gravitate toward me, but it, it might be that, I mean, for one thing, it might be completely random because these things do happen. Sometimes just reality is reality and there's no apparent explanation for it, but it, it might also be that I don't, I don't make a point of not talking about my experience, but I also don't think to bring it up often as that that might speak to the fact that I feel I'm recovered. It's, it's not something about which I think. Um, it's I, I wouldn't say that I forget it happened, but it's something which, you know, it's kind of like, uh, you know, I... I was in fifth grade. I remember that fifth grade happened, but it, it's not of uh, sufficient emotional significance for me now for me to be talking about it or, or thinking about it much. And so if I were to talk about it much more, maybe that would pan out in terms of me talking directly with other people about it more. Similarly, my, I've been much more open about my depression and many more people have reached out to me about depression. So I I think that's probably it. I think it's just reflective of, you know, the frequency with which I talk about various issues. Yeah. And, and speaking of that, like, as you said, you are very open about your, your uh, depression related issues and in videos, you talked about it in podcast episodes, you talked about it. Even now you mentioned it. Um, A, what's the reason behind being so open about it? Like, do you have an actual purpose with that? And B, um, like without, you know, going into any more detail than what you're comfortable with, what do you attribute these issues to? Like, is there like a particular thing that you're dealing with in your life or is that just like a reoccurring theme that you're still kind of figuring out as to why that happens? Sure. So to speak to the first question first... I, I was diagnosed with clinical depression in 2014. Now in hindsight, my best judgment, and I would note that I'm not a psychologist, I'm not a psychiatrist, so I'm not someone who would be able to diagnose someone else as as having depression. Um, And then even if I were in that, in that position, I, one isn't able to diagnose oneself. uh, But at least not responsibly, I'm not sure if that's even technically allowed, I'll I'll investigate this. But um, (laughs) My best judgment is that I've had clinical depression for 
uh, well, t- t- 10 years since 2007 when um, I developed anorexia. I mean, I, I think that that was, I think, had a more competent um, psychiatric professional been involved at that point, that that diagnosis would have arisen. Um, and so I had the diagnosis in 2014 and, and for about a year, I didn't talk about it at all that I can recall online. Maybe out of fear, I, I think it was kind of a feeling of it. it's private. Why would I share it? Like, just r- really why? Like, what would be the purpose? And But then it struck me. One day someone asked me a question on Instagram. I couldn't even, I can't, I really can't even remember what it was. But the truthful answer to the question was depression. Like it was a question about me and nothing bad happened. And then I think I had a light bulb moment of, I don't need, there doesn't need to be some huge, massive, compelling reason to do it. If there's no reason to not do it, why would I not speak to that issue given it's real for me? So, and I realize that's, I'm thinking that that's a slightly strange answer as opposed to, yes, I made this very deliberate decision to share this to to help other people or something like this. I, I think I more kind of stumbled into it. What, But what I would say is that now that I have spoken about it, initially it was just a little bit and more and more and more that I've been... Uh, Shocked would be an overstatement, but it's remarkable how many people have messaged me, commented on content that I've made about that. Um, it, it's clearly far more common an experience than than I understood. So I think it was definitely 100% no question, a really good decision to do that. And, you know, I, I sometimes have the thought that uh, it's much more important than any of the more explicitly fitness related stuff I do because um, I'm very compelled by the argument that depression is the worst disease anyone can have. It, you know, when you look at horrifying diseases like uh, terminal cancer, someone has a cancer which uh, there's no point in treating it. They're going to die in excruciating pain in six weeks. They're my understanding is that that some patients in that position will actually they won't say that they're literally happy that they got cancer but that time that they have will allow them to reconnect to their siblings and that you know that they hadn't talked to their best friend in 10 years because they had a falling out but they reconnect with them and they're able to spend time with their children and so many other things that maybe they ha- wouldn't have really gotten to had they just been well in that period depression tends to be incredibly destructive of everything. Um, for one thing, I think a lot of people don't realize it's, um, I, don't, I don't think we can wholly reduce it to biology, but it is a physical illness. It has in, clearly apparent physical symptoms. So it's destructive of someone's physical health, obviously mental health, I mean, by definition, but then the, the way depression can make people behave destroys their re- personal relationships because it's incredibly difficult to engage with. It can be incredibly difficult to maintain relationships with uh, or a relationship with someone who's severely depressed if, if the result is that um, they're just difficult to, to interact with. So again, that, that makes me think at times that, that it's a bigger issue. You know, it, it's like everyone has their own thing and I don't want to be someone who says, well, the person who cures cancer is clearly like way more important than the person who plays basketball, because in my mind, the person who, who plays basketball is is bettering the world. If they're you know entertaining people and, and displaying athletic prowess and all of this, but in, in just in terms of you know my narrow personal value system, um, I do think it's very important because if we're if in one case it's a discussion of should someone be consuming 1.6 or 2.4 grams of protein per kilo of, of body weight per day? I find that an interesting discussion. I find that a, a discussion worth having and, and one which I would engage in. But if 
if another discussion that is happening or could happen is this person wants to die, like this person wants to die. It's um, it feels uh, of a larger scale than, than the protein question. So again, I'm, I'm happy that I uh, got into that now. That's a really long answer to the first half of your question to the, to, you know, what mm -hmm. is it I struggle with? Um, it's hard to know how best to answer this because there are a number of different perspectives one can take on it. I do, and I don't perceive myself as an expert in this area, but I do think it's overwhelmingly likely that there's a major genetic component um, to, to come at it from a very um, anecdotal perspective. You see that depression uh, runs in families. And so I, my, my sense is that that um, loads the gun. And then actual life events then pull the trigger, um, traumatic, you know, subjectively traumatic events. So a number of different things have happened, and and I do, you know, there is. My hope is that there remains, you know, a uh, some distinction between public and private life. So, you know, a, a lot of it wouldn't make sense to get into, but I think. Um, Fundamentally, from a psychological perspective, for me, it's, I return to that term, cognitive distortion. Um, the, the depressed person is, and I don't want to say every person who's depressed, but typically when you engage with people, you even just have a conversation with a depressed person about how they're feeling, their thinking is dominated by extreme negativity, which isn't proportionate with reality. So it, it can be very basic things like I'm not good enough, but that can, if someone sincerely believes that, that can be very damaging. I'm not good enough. I'm not smart enough. I'm never going to be successful. Nothing I do counts. That's a, I'm happy to say that, that that's a, a particular issue that I struggle with is I have a, a tendency to default to thinking that everything I do has no value. Really? That, 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 that's funny because like, that's something that people watching your videos, I think would never assume. Right. Well, they want it. They want it. Think that I think that, or they want it. Think that what I do has no value. Both. Right. Like I, I yeah, like I, I think you come across as a rational analytically minded, which you probably are. And you wouldn't disagree with that, but you come across as like a very, uh, driven, confident person, I think, from your videos. Interesting. Well, I'm putting on a really good front, apparently. So I should take up, I should take up acting. I, <laughs> first of all, I, I appreciate you, you saying that. Um, I, I think it, it is, you know, probably a good sign that like, I, I am doing something good if that's the impression. Um, interestingly, I think, I think rationality, and that might be the, the wrong term intelligence might be a better term can be problematic because um, it can be used as a weapon against yourself. So, you know, this is a very reductionist way of looking at it, but my, my purely anecdotal sense is that there, there is such a thing as, um, well, one phrase is ignorance is bliss. But a, a better way of putting it would be, I, I do set, you know, and I don't know that the science back this, backs this up, but given my personal experience and the experience of, of friends of mine who have suffered from depression, um, there, there seems to be a correlation. And again, I, I don't want to make, you know, overly strong claims or claims that are ultimately incorrect, but there seems to be a correlation between um people being of above average intelligence and being depressed and like actually doing things which are remarkable things that are unusual for unusually good, you know, most that most people don't do. And, and um, viewing that through a very deflationary lens and always perceiving it as nothing. So I, I do wonder if, and, and I don't want to be the person who says, well, like I don't want to give the impression that I think, someone of average intelligence can't be depressed or someone of below average intelligence can't be depressed because surely they can. And I wouldn't 
I wouldn't want to give the impression I don't think that's real and I don't think that person's experience matters. But again, that's been my experience is it's something that you can use against you. Um, and, and that's the issue. I mean, one would never, again, going back to this concept of the cognitive distortion, oftentimes what you find is someone will have a, an ongoing um, internal narrative, which they would never use. Well, the, the, this type of cognitive distortion is called double standard. Like literally you ha you have a certain standard that you maintain for yourself, which invariably you can't meet and you would never apply it to anyone else because you are cognizant of the cognizant of the fact that it would be cruel to apply that standard to anyone else. And that's something I see with incredible in my own life, but also with, with friends and people to whom I speak about depression is um, invariably they they have this feeling that they have to do X, Y, Z and that they can't do it. But if they were to do it, that still wouldn't even be good enough. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, that, that speaks to the, the thinking patterns. Um, now, if one were to ask what even causes that, that uh, the person who can figure that out, I think is um, deserving of a Nobel prize. Right. Right. And so, um, I mean, obviously, there is a lot of kind of cliches out there, which uh, I mean, some cliches came to came to life because they are absolutely true. And I think this might be one of them. But so in all of this, like what kind of a role does, you know, weight training and, and being on point with nutrition and all of those things play for for you? How does it help you? And yeah, what is the role that this whole thing plays in your life? Yeah, I think I've kind of fallen in love with this phrase, everything matters over the past month or so. I've been, every day I've been thinking about it. And I, I think that all of these variables intersect. For example, there was a study published recently. To my knowledge, it's the only study that's looked at this. And improvements in diet were used as an intervention for depression. And it was a well-designed study, two groups, um, the subjects were depressed. One group did, uh, it wasn't group therapy, but it was essentially group socializing, like that was regarded as the control. And another group was given uh, dietary counseling. They were, they were given dietary recommendations consistent with the Mediterranean diet, if I recall correctly. And they did look at, you know, what the subjects were eating prior and by the end of the study and, and outcomes in terms of depression and just literally only altering their diet significantly improved their depression. So that's, so, you know, I eat a healthy diet both because you know, I do desire to decrease the likelihood I'm going to get cancer in 48 years or whatever it might be. Um, I don't want to die of a heart attack and so on. But I'm also, um, I, I view that as a means of addressing mental health. And anecdotally, that that's definitely helped. Interestingly, there's, there is a confounder there, which is, it's called the meaning response. If, if I sincerely believe that making that change will work, and there's also data backing it up, so it will have some effect on its own. But then the, the fact that it has the meaning to me of this will help me makes it even more effective, which, which isn't a problem. That's just an interesting uh, – something interesting to mention. Like there, there are two prongs to that in my mind. Similarly with resistance training, definitely you can come at it from a very cut and dry perspective of, okay, you uh, resistance train, so you have bigger biceps – all the chicks and the dudes also at the beach are like Myron, Myron, your gains. And, you know, all that, you know, all the, 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 the really obvious things, but um, it definitely helps from a mental health aspect. I was actually, this quickly gets so far outside the scope of what I understand because I imagine the only people who remotely understand it are people who have doctorates in this area. But to my knowledge, resistance training, um, like it, it actually has direct mechanistic effects on 
the synthesis of a particular compound that like for which tryptophan is a precursor and tryptophan is also a precursor to serotonin. So I think what we're going to see is if it hasn't already been shown in literature, I don't understand resistance training directly affects pathways, which are implicated in depression. So it, it's both, I can come at it from the anecdotal perspective of I lift weights. I usually feel better when I, which is interesting. I mean, it's, it's one of the worst aspects of depression in practice is it's self-sustaining. Someone has depression. They don't want to move. So they don't move and they want to die because they haven't done anything. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's, it's really horrifying. I mean, it's one of the, um, if, if one were able to inflict that deliberately upon someone, it, it would absolutely, absolutely meet any reasonable uh, qualification of, or conception of torture. I mean, it would just be the, horrifying. Um, so, so what's very interesting is that uh, depression makes it harder to do everything, which speaking for me means I frequently, um, don't want to train or, or have a, a thought in my mind of it, it being more difficult than it is. But most of the time when I actually get it done, I feel much better. Um, so yeah, again, I, I would, I would say that it both, it's clearly physically beneficial. It has the, like in terms of physical health, it, it improves body composition but then it's also uh, conducive to improved mental health if that's, you know, something about which someone's concerned. Yeah, yeah. It's 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 actually just just kind of a random thought that that came to me is that, um, I mean, I I, I never s- struggled uh, with clinical depression, but I definitely like when I came to resistance training, like when I found resistance training for myself. I've definitely been struggling with an emotionally difficult period in my own life. And that I know that um, two years ago at this point, when I got injured in in my shoulder at one point, that was one of the most uh, emotionally and psychologically difficult things that I've had to deal with, uh, simply because all of a sudden I felt like that thing that I was holding on to as kind of like this, I don't know, um, this crutch in a sense was taken away from me. So and I could still find ways to to work out and and you know not lose pro- progress completely, but uh, yeah, I guess it's um, not now. I almost look at it like if I was to get injured in such a way that you know I just couldn't move my my body at all. I don't know. I maybe suffered some severe spinal injury or something like that. Honestly, I would be I would be scared as to what would happen to me. Like, does that ever cross your mind? Like, what would happen if training would be taken away from you all of a sudden for some reason. I, I can't say I've thought about it. It's, um, it sounds like an interestingly uh, negative uh, scenario to <laughs> consider. So it, it's funny that I haven't, but I tend to think I'd be fine in that. I mean, if, if I were unable to resist and train, but could still literally just walk outside, I think I could make that work. Now, if it were a scenario of uh, bed rest, um, I I really don't. It would be very challenging. You know, I I don't know how I would um, make that work, but um, yeah. I, so I guess I will do what I can to avoid that that situation. I, I think. You know, I, I would note, and I, I was thinking about this previously, you know, prior to you asking this question, um, to my knowledge, there, you know, I don't know the rate at which this occurs, but there's a known phenomenon of um, depression arising from, uh, you know, someone will get in a car accident and, uh, you know, they might be bedridden. And and then you have to ask the question of what really is the cause, but there seems to be a correlation between you know, p- forced inactivity and depression. Um, so yeah, I, I think it's beyond any kind of reasonable doubt now that even for the person who doesn't have pre-existing uh, clinical depression, 
there's a, a huge psychological component to exercise. And I think, um, I think there's a risk of looking at you know, resistance training, cardio, whatever it might be, purely in terms of whether it's calories burned, it's going to have such and such effect on hypertrophy, et cetera, as opposed to how does it make the person feel really like that's, I, I would leave it there. How does it make them feel broadly? So to give an example, I've become, I used to be quite um, skeptical of cardio. I, I think, I think I fell somewhat for the trap of thinking it's cool for people to not do cardio. You, you know, you notice coaches who use this. Um, I perceive it as a, as largely a marketing point of this person got treaded. They weren't doing cardio, et cetera. And I've, I've come to wonder more and more why, why is that good? You know, why, why would we be happy about that? Um, and, and the answer is, you know, everyone hates cardio, whatever it might be. But I think that's, I think the scope has been narrowed too much. I think we need to talk about, um, you know, it might make sense to recommend that someone walk outside every day, not because the 112 additional calories they're burning is the biggest deal, but because they feel a lot better doing it. And then maybe they feel more focused in their work and they're more productive, you know, whatever it might be. Um, so again, I, I think I, I understand why people come at it from the perspective of, is this going to make my triceps bigger? Um, you know, is it directly affecting my recovery so I can train harder, et cetera? I think all of those things matter, but I don't think all of those things are all of the things about which you need to think. Right. Sure. And um, so, yeah, I guess just to to, to wrap this theme up here, um, and, and I don't want to keep you here much longer, but so you mentioned that your goal with your service and your coaching service is to create a platform where people can find ways for themselves to become happier versions of themselves, basically. So um, at, at the same time, like, how would you classify yourself? Would you classify yourself as like a member of the evidence-based crowd or because this, what you just mentioned, sounds more like a kind of a personal development fitness um, hybrid kind of thing? Sure. I definitely see where you're coming from on that. And I do, I, I don't like, I think there's a real risk of someone regarding themselves as being evidence-based, like they're the one to decide that. I certainly um, endeavor to, to meet the um, evidence-based practice standard, which is you know, the intersection of a, an understanding of the scientific literature and, you know, best like that, which you discern as being most effective in practice and then um, personal preference, essentially. There are many components to this and, and it becomes an expansive discussion. Um, so it's the two answers that come to mind are one, I'm not sure it matters. Like, I'm not sure it's of particular significance to me, you know, if someone regards me as. Like if someone were to say, Ian, I regard you as um, a lifestyle coach. I'm not sure I would think to, to describe myself as a lifestyle coach, but if someone thinks that and they look at my content and it benefits them, then that's the key, you know, them benefiting somehow from my content. If someone, I mean, this is a funny example. If someone regards me as a scientist I think that's technically incorrect. I'm I'm not a scientist. I'm not a professional scientist. I don't do um, I don't do research. But if that's the lens through which they see me, and they look at my content and they find it valuable, then I'm pleased that they find my content valuable. I think. And so that's kind of the first answer. But then the second would be. I do really get into that cut and dry physiological stuff a lot. I mean, I, I read a lot of literature that's nothing to do with psychology, uh, nothing to do with a lot of what we've discussed today. So I do think on the one hand, um, I, a, a lot of people probably regard me as, you know, a pretty straightforward evidence-based guy. 
And then all of the discussion of depression and psychology and wanting to be happier and all of this is maybe distinct from that. And if, if someone wants to view that as something I do separately, like two different sides of the same coin, like Ian is the evidence-based guy and also the guy who talks about depression. And I, I, I can, I'm happy with that too. So again, I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure I would object unless, you know, someone were to say Ian definitely isn't evidence-based um, because I, I think that's technically inaccurate. Right. So, um, so like what, um, I guess, guess to guess, to just, just wrap up here. Like now we see you doing a couple of things. I mean, I, interestingly enough, I don't see you promote your, I mean, I see, you know, your coaching service being mentioned, uh, under your YouTube video, but for example, do you, do you have a, a website? Like I haven't been able to, to find one. We're working on it. It's almost finished. Okay. So, uh, so you're growing your online presence then like, what is, what is kind of the, the vision? Like, do you ever sit down and like contemplate like, okay, what, where do I want lifting for life and no bullshit bodybuilding your brands be, you know, in a couple of years time, do you like actively um, plan these things in your mind? Well, I think about them constantly. I would say, I don't think, I don't feel I have the answer for one thing, and I think there are a number of aspects to that. For one thing, I don't particularly like the idea of long-term planning, but let me clarify what I mean by that. I'm not saying that I don't think people should save for retirement or something like that, or they shouldn't, you know, I'm not saying I don't think a 22-year-old should think about whether or not they might want to have children when they're 28. I mean, certainly it's one thing to to be responsible now to consider how things are going to pan out. But if I were to tell you, well, uh, lifting for life, it's got to be this, like two years from now, I want to have a particular number of clients. I want it to be like this. I, I want the Facebook page to have so many likes. I mean, I think it's, there's so many, so many variables outside of your control that you might, you might not even have any concept of, Maybe Instagram dies in two years. I think it's very unlikely, but maybe that's the thing. Maybe, um, maybe something happens in my private life that causes me to profoundly reassess everything I'm doing. I mean, there are any number of things which, you know, you don't even have to envision the ridiculous things like maybe an alien invasion, like things that could definitely happen, um, could happen and, and would would mess with someone's long-term plans. So I am very much more focused on what I'm doing now. And another component of it is I'm not sure. Um, you know, I, I still, I don't have everything worked out. I, I don't think anyone does, but, and, and I'm not sure. It's hard to know how much most people actually have figured out because there does seem to be a sense that Maybe you don't want to say that. Maybe you don't want to be the person who's like, I don't know what the fuck I'm doing with my life. Like, because that's, that's a flaw. That's imperfect. You know, you want like, so it, it really could be that 98% of people who are in a similar position to me um, are, uh, are similarly uncertain of how things are going to pan out and how they want them to pan out. And, and we don't know that because people don't talk about it as much as is true. On the other hand, that could not be the case. Um, yeah, I'm continuously thinking about, you know, what I want, what I want to do with lifting for life, and whether or not I want to go back to school, when, where, what I'm going to study. You know, I might even go in a really different direction with that. And for example, something I've considered very, very seriously is uh, pursuing psychology initially. Because, because I'm so interested in it and also like full disclosure, it, it would be easier and that would lower the bar for really getting the ball rolling again. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm very, very open-minded while at the, the day-to-day -day level and um, it's an extreme focus on, you know, whatever's happening right now programming, you know, data, 
well, data collection is not the correct term. Um, like mm-hmm. doing a big literature search for something right now, as an example. Um, so, yeah, it's. I think. Interestingly, I think one can be fairly unsure of kind of a long term concept while still being productive. And, and I would say that the the fundamental is. And it's an imperative that what I do be benefiting people. I mean, that, that's just a constant. So, but that can take many different forms. So, so that's like that I would say is the rock. And then, so that's part of it. And then again, day to day, you know, I'm doing right now a lot of programming, like doing my own training, uh, work with clients, et cetera. But but then kind of in between those two, the, the question of um, what exactly do I want the, the business to do, to look like, et cetera, there's more uncertainty. Right. So, uh, so Ian, I, like, this, this has been a really interesting conversation and we didn't even get to, I mean, I wanted to, to uh, get your take on a lot of things, like, for example, how, you know, guys end up in a perpetual cutting cycle, like... Uh, how you how you're progressing with your bulk and you know how you know how your your take on you know developing eating disorders and and those kinds of things in the fitness industry which is very common so we didn't get to touch on that but we did get to touch on a lot of things i guess to just um my very last question for you is a very selfish one and will be useful for anybody who is a content producer on youtube which is you have a successful YouTube channel, you have a big following, and you are, you know, at a very young age, not like I'm, I'm a super old dude, but, you know, at, at a young age, you are a well-respected uh, figure in this whole whole arena. So if you had to, like, break it down to a couple of primary factors, like, what would you mainly attribute your success to if, if you were waterboarded to, <laughs> to be forced to, ask, to answer this question? Well, that, that's an interesting image. Uh, I think I would, I'm happy to answer it without being waterboarded. So that it, it's a good workaround there. Um, All right. Yeah, I think, I think it's objectively the case that a lot of my early penetration was a result of me calling people out. Now, that's not something I desire to do now or am interested in. I think um, it was very stress inducing and I'm very, um, averse to that now it's something i strongly desire to avoid um but it it worked they worked in the sense a couple of different metrics in my mind the more important one is it resulted I, i think that my rise to greater prominence was in in what it is i was saying was the primary driver of flexible dieting being accepted within the YouTube fitness community. Um, I do, I am, I'm not one to typically feel like I'm owed things, et cetera, but I I think it's um, unfortunate and inaccurate that, that other people have taken credit for that. But in any case, Mm -hmm. um, so, and and that arose as a function of, um, me just very directly saying that particular people were wrong, making videos about it, et cetera. Um, and so uh, again, I use the phrase like it's objective, like that is what happened. What I can't, there's, there's no way around that, but it isn't what I would do now. Um, and it, it's not what I would recommend to people because it just doesn't feel the right way to do things. Um, I'm much more in the camp of, um, you know, do your own thing. And if you're good enough, then that will be reflected in in how people respond. And so I think, I think the, to turn this around into more actionable, because I think that's where you were going is your, your thought was, how can we make this uh, give specific, direct, practical recommendations? I think start with, what is it you actually want to do? What is it you care about? Because the, the kind of work and patience that you're going to have to to use to get what you want is will be much easier 
if you sincerely care about it. Um, and, and I think there's a real risk. Like I wouldn't some I, I wouldn't want someone who fundamentally wants to let's say like really what they want is to work with clients in person, but they go the vlog route, not because they actually like vlogs, but because like that's the popular thing. That that could work out well, but it could also work out in a way that w- wouldn't make them happy. So again, start with a sense of what you care about, what you want to do, what you're good at, and then allow it to be an extension of that. And then combine that with that, you know, you certainly have to be cognizant of what actually works in terms of marketing and so on. So make use of the available social media platforms in a way that's appropriate to them. Instagram being fundamentally a photo platform. YouTube being a, a, a video platform, vlogs being most popular on YouTube at this time, et cetera, and medium form content being ideal for Facebook, long form content being ideal for websites, et cetera. So I think that's the, if one, really the goal is to intersect those two things, like both kind of your personal value system, et cetera. And then if you can tie that in with an understanding of how these platforms work, then that will allow you to succeed. And I I also think there's a major component. It it would be irresponsible not to acknowledge that there is a major component of just competence that's to a large extent either there or not. Um, So I wouldn't want to give the impression that everyone can succeed in the online fitness sphere. Um, I think that the, the people, the people who rise to the top there, it, it isn't always the case that they are the best. I mean, sometimes it's being their first kind of thing. Um, but I don't want every single person to think um, if they just, you know, make the right Instagram posts and, post about studies on Facebook um, and make YouTube vlogs, that's that's guaranteed success. So there is definitely a, a, a less controllable, I think, aspect of talent, I guess, really is what I'm thinking about here. That if it isn't, if it isn't present, I'm not sure one can develop it. And if it isn't present, I'm not sure that that's something that you can override with uh, just using the right the right strategies, so it's a bit of a negative note to end on, but it, it speaks to <laughs> it speaks to uh, what I allude what I mentioned earlier, which is you know having an understanding of of what it is you're good at. So again, to use the previous example, someone might I use the example of someone who wants to be a personal trainer, but someone might actually be like their potential for being a personal trainer could be much, much, much higher than their potential for being an online coach or a public figure online. And it might be a mistake for them to really think that they're going to be the next Christian Guzman when they, there, there's nothing they can do to be the next Christian Guzman. But man, they would be a really good personal trainer. And I would want people to be uh, cognizant of that and not run themselves into the ground trying to do something that isn't going to work. So it's, yeah. it's positive and negative. It's really the yeah. positive of, of figure out what's going to work and then put your energy into that. <coughs> yeah. And I guess just to put a slightly more positive twist uh, on this, I think um, like one thing is for sure is that you will need something like, for example, uh, Christian Guzman, what he has for the most part is that he looks really good. The same <clears throat> same thing could be said for a lot of similar YouTubers. Um, what my Dr. Mike Israel knows extremely well is just coming up with these crazy good analogies and putting sci- very complex scientific things in a in an entertaining and simple manner. And then you have someone like, you know, Dr. Brett Schoenfeld, when he gives interviews, it's not super, you know, dynamic and exciting and and glamorous. It's, you know, Mm -hmm. more dry scientific facts. But, you know, what he has and what Christian Guzman doesn't have is just crazy amounts of knowledge on muscle hypertrophy. So 
you will need to stand out with one thing and you can kind of choose what you want to stand out with. Some things you can choose and some other things you can't. Like you can't you can choose to have the genetics of Christian Guzman or Matt Ogus, but you mm-hmm. can choose to, you know, become the most knowledgeable person in the in, in the industry that you know. That's always something you can work on. I guess. Would you agree with that? Yes, I, I would say don't um... Don't bullshit yourself. I hope you don't mind the swearing. Don't bullshit yourself regarding what is out. I I love this phrase, like fundamental capacity, meaning like you cannot change it. Um, I I don't know what this is in in, uh, meters or centimeters, but I'm five foot nine. There's nothing I can do to be six, six. Like it just nothing I can do. Um, so it's not something I think about remotely, but I'm cognizant of, okay, if I really wanted to be some super famous basketball player, it is not going to happen. There is nothing I can do to make that happen. Meanwhile, within the, within the things that I can control, um, I at least endeavor to be very aggressive in, in, uh, you know, doing what I can consistent with what I want to do consistent with, you know, what I feel is meaningful and makes me happy, et cetera. So that that's the balance is um, not, you know, you don't look like Christian Guzman, so you're just really going to try really hard to look like Christian. But it's like you don't like mm-hmm. you're not going to look like Christian. So so don't you know? Don't try to be Christian Guzman v- version 2.0. Be yourself, which again might be a personal trainer or who even knows. Yeah, cool. Thank you so much, EM, for dropping all these golden nuggets. Just maybe tell people where they can find you and all absolutely. Those Thanks so much. And I'd be happy to be back to talk about the the non-depressed uh, topics, non-depression, oh, it, it, depression related. It would be an honor to, to have you on for another time for sure. Awesome. Sounds good. Talk soon. All right. That was pretty funny because at this point, actually, Ian just vanished from the call. So it was a pretty abrupt turn. But I really enjoyed this interview and make sure to check out Ian's stuff. He, you can find him on Instagram, on YouTube with the name Lifting for Life also he's on Facebook if you just google his name Ian McCarthy or if you google lifting for life or no bullshit bodybuilding you will definitely be able to find him and I linked to all of his resources in the show notes so you should be able to find him that way all right guys Abel here again hope you enjoyed this episode if you did please subscribe on YouTube if you watched it there I come out with new content every week there whether it's in the form of a podcast episode like this which I actually aim to do one off every week or some shorter informational video also if you could just leave a comment and suggest some people that you'd like me to interview or just topics you'd like me to cover uh, it would be very helpful to know how I can better serve you and if you listen to it in podcast format if you could leave a rating on itunes it would greatly help out the show and i would be more than grateful for it so thanks guys for hanging out up until now thanks for being here and see you all next week